Uh, we're extraordinarily pleased to have with us uh, Lieutenant General uh, Dave uh, Alvin, uh, who all of you know is a director, a Joint Staff Director of Strategy Plans and Policy. Uh, in this role, he provides strategic direction, policy guidance, and planning focus for the execution of our national military strategy. Uh, he's a graduate of the Air Force Academy in 1986, uh, and he's held a variety of different command assignments uh, at squadron and uh, wing levels to include commanding general NATO Air Training Command in Afghanistan, commander of the 438th Air Expeditionary Wing in Afghanistan, uh, the commander of the 618th Air and Space Operations Center, uh, and where I got to know him pretty well and admire his work is his director of strategy concepts and assessments uh, in the Air Force's uh, strategy shop. Then he went over to Europe uh, as the director of uh, strategy plans and uh, policy at the headquarters uh, U.S. European uh, Command. So without further ado, please uh, help me in welcoming uh, Lieutenant General Almond. Dave, floor is yours. Well, good morning, and uh, thanks for that introduction, Dave. I, I uh, walked in here, and I couldn't put my finger on it, but I suddenly started to become intimidated where I wasn't out there. And then I started looking and seeing why there are a tremendous number of uh, intellectual giants, air power advocates, and people who have stayed on the pointy edge of the value of air power. And I realized that I've been out of wearing the uniform, but I've been out of that you know, blue business for about four years. So go easy on me in the air power stuff because I've gone purple, and so I may not be as, as, uh, as crisp on those particular issues. But I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come and share a dialogue with you today. Um, as I was preparing for this, of course, when I got the invitation, this is such a great uh, institution that I wanted to be a part of it. And so um, absolutely said yes, put together sort of the talking points that I thought, the things that I'm working on. And it wasn't honestly until sort of like last night that I went through it all again and I was charged up about it and then I realized this is sort of wonky stuff. So, so I'm gonna try and make sure that if I get into the wonkery too much, you guys can correct me and get back out of it because we're in the middle of this and there's a lot of sausage making that's going on uh, with respect to sort of the, the direction that we're trying to move the joint force. And so I get, I get excited about that. I get interested in the details but I'm gonna try and see if I can uh, keep it at the strategic level um, that's appropriate for this audience. But as we talk about you know, the title, Global Integration in 21st Century Conflict uh, from Strategy to Action, uh, that's a pretty big title. I wanna make sure I can, I can build a content to, uh, to meet that. But it's about change, primarily. It's the, that's the backdrop is change. And it's changing and it's adapting uh, the joint force to the environment uh, in which we find ourselves. Uh, and so as I look at this is another natural audience to talk about that because we have air power in general uh, and, and those who advocate for it and those who are practitioners of it understand that's just a part of the business being able to adapt and to innovate. Um, the joint forces working to catch up with that particular concept and this is, this is part of the, the work that we have ahead of us. But that change obviously you're changing to adapt the environment and I'm not going to sort of shoot behind the duck with this audience, understanding some of the characters that, that, uh, uh, that really define that change. Uh, the, the speed at which the environment's coming at us, the agility that it requires, uh, the global nature of things. And uh, we were just talking before, uh, Dave and I were talking, the, the, uh, the tenets of global vigilance, global reach, and global power have been in the Air Force now for a couple decades. Uh, and so this idea of global integration, joint forces sort of coming to meet to, to meet the fight here. But the fact that that concept, that idea, that ethos about global vision for reaching power, um, really it recognizes that air power has always crossed seams and been able to, to understand the, how to do that and how to do that the way that is, that is most effective for the nation. And so as we find ourselves on the joint force trying to do the same thing, this is really where this concept of global integration uh, was born out of. Uh, and you may find me in a couple of areas, and I'll try and make sure I'm good about citing the source so I don't have public plagiarism here, but I, I, I will quote the, the chairman uh, uh, a couple of times because our chairman is, is uniquely gifted, I, I, I think, working for him 
in his ability to say things as crisp and pure as just about anybody. He's one of those magnificent communicators. And so as we try and take the chairman's thoughts and put them into our own, they just sound really dumb in comparison. So I'd rather just say, this is what the chairman said, and, and uh, be, able to, be able to pass it along. But as the chairman talks about some of the three uh, real elements that have driven us uh, to this need, the imperative for global integration, is first where he talks about uh, you know, the change in character of warfare, and that is that it is more so than ever before, it is transregional. It's, we, we can no longer confine one particular adversary to one particular geographic region that we can sort it out and, and, uh, and reach our objectives and then come on home. It's, it's also uh, all domain. And what we mean by all domain is not just sums, but that just about anything we're thinking about getting engaged in, anything we're contemplating, <laughs> is going to involve all domains, and we have to integrate that better, which means to maybe stop using uh, or thinking about cyber and space as a sort of mystical thing that's in addition to the traditional domains. It's integral, it's foundational, and it's absolutely critical to have those domains integrated into our way of war and a way of thinking about how we're preparing the joint force. So, th so the character he talks about is, is changing, but also the the budget's not getting any bigger, and people say, we got a pretty big budget. Yes, we do. But given the, the threats that we face across the globe, we're never going to be able to have uh, the force to address each one individually and be able to have sufficient force and capabilities in one place at one time. So we have to be able to find ways that we can address them all with the budget that we have. So there's, there's a cost element of that. And then it's the speed of that talk. We, we have to be able to, as a joint force, improve up our game in speed of recognition, speed of decision, and speed of action, because it's coming at us that fast. And so with those as, as the backdrop, um, that's really what, the, what we have as the impetus for what we're doing with global integration. Um, and then w while I go through this, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we're trying to actually make it something beyond just a thought and a concept. I think all of us who have done work in strategy and, and in plans, you know, they want to make strategy matter. They want to make it not a fantastic strategy that sits on a shelf and people look at it academically and go, that's a pretty neat idea. But if you believe in it, and it's something upon which you ostensibly, ostensibly are going to base your approach on, you need to make sure you have a method to translate that into the activities that you're going to do. Otherwise, as, as I think we've seen uh, too many times, there's been a lot of good strategies that have just sort of parked and, and not much been done with. And so um, as, we're, as we're moving forward in this global integration path, we need to make sure that we integrate it into the processes that we have to make sure that that strategy does translate into action. Um, so when we talk about, we'll start with the national military strategy. Uh, this is the, the second um, classified one in a row. The first one was 2016. The, the second one was a 2018. And there's, there's going to be an unclassified sort of summation of that that's going to be delivered here uh, any day. But the, the, the main idea behind it is it still recognizes that we have these five uh, trans-regional threats that can, that can really threaten us in, in all domains. And primarily, we talk about China and Russia, North Korea, Iran. And then we have uh, violent extremism that really runs the gamut across the globe. Uh, and with those as things we all need to pay attention to, the real theme, the character of the, the latest national military strategy is really that of a boxer stance. And so the elements of that, of that boxer stance mean that you have to be able to have the strength and the power to throw the punch uh, when you have to. Uh, you, have to also, you have to be able to be agile enough. And I think you'll see some of these are themes that have been developed over, within our Air Force over the past several years. You need to be agile enough. You need to have the endurance to take that first punch and keep going. You have to be able to resilience to be able to defend yourself against that. But the idea that even though we have these multiple challenges, we have to be able to respond to them in an agile and adept way simultaneously. And that, that really runs through the national military strategy. And that's probably the, the biggest change between 2016. 2016 was novel, and it actually called out those uh, five challenges. And now we're refining that in, in our approach to be able to respond to those five challenges. Um, so in, in order to execute that national military strategy and not have it sit on a shelf, we have to integrate it into the processes that go on within the department. And that's, so now, it's, now we're getting to the wonky part, right? So if, if you're a commander, you, you, know, you, you have the tools. You have the mission, a clear set of the mission. You have the forces. You have the capabilities at hand. And you have command authority, 
right? And so that's how you are going to drive the behavior within your organization in order to execute the mission. So if you're trying to take that up to the sort of the staff level, the joint staff level, you don't have a lot of those things. You don't have command authority. Uh, you don't have, you know, capabilities. You don't have a lot of those things that you would have in a normal command to be able to, to affect change and execute a mission appropriately. But what you do have is, this is the wonky part, you got process, right? You got processes, you have timelines, you have suspenses that drive decisions, and those decisions will shape the way that you can have the activities down the road. So really the, the art inside of the bureaucracy uh, is to be able to infuse the tenets of global integration throughout each of those processes. And it goes from the planning process to the force management process into the force development, force design process. So that's, that's really what we're, we're trying to do with taking that strategy and putting it into action. Um, and for those of you who have uh, had to struggle through uh, some, of the, some of the professional military education, fantastic, and I see some folks who have actually uh, been purveyors of that. But some of it, remember we used to have to go through the whole, the joint strategic planning system and it was, the donuts of death, they call it, and it was really, it was tough to really get through. That, that, that's, that, that unfortunately, are the tools that we have, but we have to integrate uh, this new way of thinking into those tools, because that's how, that's how the business gets done. Because there are a few things that the department, not, I'm not talking about the combatant commanders who are actually executing, but the department who, who puts together these processes that enables them to do that, there's really one fixed variable that you have, and that's the budget, right? And so if you don't understand and, and tie the things that you have against the budget, then, then you're going to miss the boat. You'll have interesting meetings, but it'll be, well, well, we'll catch that in next year's budget. So you have to orient yourself against that. Uh, so when we think about how we integrate these, the, the strategy and turn it into action, the next thing you have after strategy is plans. And so this is a, this is a change that has to take place across all the combatant commands because Traditionally, in the combatant commands, you have your theater campaign plan. We're all familiar with those. That, that's at the behest of the combatant commander that says, these are the activities that I'm going to do within my geographic area of responsibility, uh, as set out by the UCP. And what that drives, though, it drives sort of a, a cottage industry solution. So you have, this is what the UCOM commander thinks about how they may want to address some of the threats emanating from Russia. Russia is also in the CENTCOM AOR. Uh, Russia is also, uh, you know, in other AORs doing other things. So if you have one combatant command approach to one of the challenges, and then you, you add all those together with the other ones, it may not make sense. It may not make a, a, a competent narrative that you can really comprehensively address that challenge. So one of the adaptations that we made in the planning area is we've gone to these things called the global campaign plans. Uh, and what that really does is it tries to address these challenges across the globe and see from a holistic perspective what we believe they're doing that are potentially at odds with our national interests and how we might want to address them globally. Uh, and so that requires a little bit of a different uh, of a arrangement. You know, you still have the combatant command authority in the UCP. That has not changed. So I, I need to say this also. This idea of global integration is done absolutely within the existing authorities. There is no change in authority, you know, that would require change in a law that has been contemplated in this, concept, in this context. But it's the chairman's strong opinion that if he is going to be able to give advice, good advice, advice that is relevant to the time in which we find ourselves, there has to be more of an integrated approach to this for him to give better advice to the secretary. So when, when combatant commander X asks for these forces, we don't know necessarily the risk to the strategy or to the other challenge of the strategy if those forces flow there. And so this, it's imperative for the chairman to be able to have that global perspective to give good advice to the secretary who's gonna to have to give same to the president. So these global campaign plans give us a little bit of vision into that because they can address holistically how actions in one theater might support or be at odds with actions in another theater. So that's, that's one area of it. Um, the, the global campaign plans are sort of the day-to-day, -day, right? The, they're, they're taken from the theater campaign plans, which are sort of the day-to-day -day activity. And then we have our traditional contingency plans. Those are sort of the break glass if you're gonna actually uh, perceive yourself in a, in a full-blown kinetic fight. Those are also somewhat stovepiped, in, 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 and necessarily because they are built by combatant commanders designed to fight a potential threat in your particular AOR. But when it comes to these global challenges, 
you probably won't be fighting them just in one war. I mean, for example, if, if God forbid, we something were to happen of a, a, a sort of a kinetic nature or uh, aggressive nature vis-a-vis -vis Russia, we, we can't really think about them just in their next door neighbor in Europe. There are implications for the homeland. There are implications for strategic deterrence. And those implications are guided by their own O plans. But if those O plans aren't put together in one comprehensive look, again, we have the same problem of where we, we may not know if one activity that's being conceived is supporting the entire objective or not because they're disparate. So we are uh, not replacing, not replacing the operational plans, but we are supplementing them with what we call the globally integrated base plans. And I don't want to make too much of it. There's, we're not starting from whole cloth when the Joint Staff is putting these globally integrated base plans together. But we're actually, we're actually being able to take that plan and put it in a global context. What do I mean? It's not only what I just talked about, which is understanding one theater or another theater against the same adversary. But as you're contemplating actions against one of these five challenges, we now have a, a methodology by which we can understand the implications with a, another challenge. So if one were to uh, you know, get into conflict with Russia, we have an idea what that might mean for our deterrence activities vis-a-vis -vis China, Iran, North Korea, where we didn't really have a concept of that before. But, but we, we can get that because we have the building blocks of the global campaign plans that says in the context of a fight over there, we still want to do deterrence and assurance activities in other theaters. But when you put it all together in a globally integrated base plan, that allows just a different perspective for the chairman to say, hey, Mr. Secretary or Madam Secretary, whoever it is, to be able to take up to the president and say, here are some of your options, and here are some of the implications of those options with respect to the entire national defense strategy under which the national military strategy is, is written to, to nest. So if that makes sense, we, you, you, you can't just have a, a, a strategy that recognizes the trans-region on all domain nature and not have your plans reflect that as well. Otherwise, you have what? You have a very interesting academic document that sits on the shelf. So that's what these plans are designed to do. And this is tough going. And I, I know there's a lot of people who have done this before in your past. So you can imagine, think about this. Think about trying to change that mindset. Um, and we do it like everything else we're doing, uh, we're, we're trying to change. We don't do it with additional resources because they ain't coming. They ain't coming. Those, those resources are going to be relatively fixed or we have to almost, almost surmise that they might be shrinking. So how do we do this? We have to be, we have to be creative in the way that we matrix across the combatant commands to have them do not only their, their own job, but to think outside of their AORs to be able to support um, the global nature of the threats. So you've got your strategy, and now we've got these, these, this plan construct that expands it from just the regional to the global. That's still interesting, but it doesn't really get exciting until, because plans have been known to sit on a shelf as well, right? Those are fascinating. But until you actually translate those plans into activities and forces. Now people get interested. Because if anyone who's been in the, either on the combatant command staff or, or the service staff or the joint staff that sees the tension that goes with trying to allocate those forces. The combatant commanders, they know exactly what they need to achieve their mission. The services are trying to balance that with the readiness they're trying to preserve or create or improve on some occasions, if we can, to be able to uh, prepare for a conflict that we don't want to get into, but we want to be able to dominate in. And the Joint Staff is trying to, trying to mix all that around and balance risk. So if those plans do not inform the force management activities, then, then they're pretty much dormant. So that's really where, that's the next sort of part of the path that we're on, is starting with the assessment of those plans and where we think that we are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, meeting our objectives in our global campaign plans and preparedness for, for the global integrated base plans. That should be advising. That should be sort of top-down strategic guidance rather than the bottom-up requests that are legitimate requests that come from each of the combatant commands, but they're not globally informed. That's, a, that's tough sledding. That's tough sledding, but it's absolutely necessary. And tough decisions have to be made. And so if you at least have the analytic background informed by the global campaign plans that will enable you to do that, uh, it at least gives the secretary uh, some better... Um, basis upon which to make some of these tough decisions or propose to the president. Um, so that, that's some of the force management piece. The first is, in, the third is in force development, force design. Now this is the fascinating part. 
because when we're talking about change, so far I've really been talking about how it affects we're gonna, what we're going to do with what we got, right? But when we aggregate some of the individual operational plans and we see that there are resource tensions even when you put those plans together, and in some cases there's not enough to go around of some of the critical assets, um, that for, for the, the today part of that is, that informs your risk discussion. So we have to understand where we can take most risk and where we may uh, have to accept it and maybe alter some of our decisions. But I always, as, as, a, as a planner, and I say that I sort of came to the planning gig late, uh, but I've gained an appreciation for it. Um, the first thing that, that, that happens when there's that realization of, hey, wait a minute, now it's, we don't have all the stuff we need for that, is, is this, well, build a better plan. It, and, and at first it's like, well, it's, until I thought about it, I thought, well, it's, I guess we gotta build another better plan. But when you break down planning, and I apologize for all those uh, who have been planners from the start and are sort of emotionally invested in that particular uh, uh, skill set, they're just a, there's a few basic building blocks to plans that you're given. So the idea that we're going to take these ba building blocks you're given and magically put the Jenga puzzle together a little differently uh, is a little tough to do. I mean, when you think about it, what, what, what do planners have at their disposal? Well, first of all, they have the planning guidance that's given from the president says what to plan against. Okay, so now we've got this we've got to plan against. And then you've got, in addition to that, you've got the intelligence community assessment about how we believe that the enemy's going to fight. You put that into your planning block. And then the third, we have policy end states. This, these are a policy objectives we're trying to achieve against this particular adversary in this type of, okay, put that block over there. Now you're starting to build the blocks. The fourth is we have forces, we have capabilities. Those planners don't make up those capabilities. They're given to them. And then the last thing that you have is the way in which those capabilities are used, the operational concepts and the like. Planners don't have access to change in those either. Those aren't, you, you don't take in a plan and go, I'm gonna tell, tell the Army and the Air Force to get together and fight a little bit differently. If, if they don't have the training against it and the, and, and the operational concepts that are bought in at the service level, you just can't do that at a command command. So you're given all of these things and you just put them together. So it, it tells you if, if they don't fit right, if they don't work right, you, you, can, you can examine, maybe you weren't very thoughtful in it, but our planners have pretty good training. You probably have to think about what are some of those inputs? How do you change those inputs? Re-examine your policy end states. Nope, that's exactly where we want to go. We're not changing that. Okay, set that on the shelf. Well, let's, how about getting more capabilities? Okay, good luck with that. There's a, the budget battles are out there. So, okay, maybe we can't, maybe we can't go to there, all right? Um, hey, maybe we can get a better, a different take on how the enemy intends to fight. Well, that's, no, I mean, unless the enemy's changed their mind, we shouldn't be changing our mind about how we think the enemy's gonna fight, all right? So it's starting to narrow down to a couple of things. And really the one, the one thing is concept development. How do we think we want to change the way we fight in the future? And I would submit that there's some fertile ground there to be tilled, that there are ideas that the individual services have or some, some even multi-service that haven't been really baked into a, into a joint concept yet, that's where you're really gonna make your money. Because I think there's a, there's a institutional um, slowness, if you will, on, on, on moving forward. And that we got, we've got to have that, in, that catalyst that drives those concepts to be developed more rapidly. Um, and they will inform the future capabilities that will make that concept better. But there are, there are a few things that we know we've got to be able to do, those things that have, that have really made us the military we are and enabled the, the nation to be the nation that is. One of the things is that we're able to project power globally. Nobody knows that better than the Air Force. And air power does that. But we have to do that in a, uh, in a joint way. We have to be able to project the entire force. Potential adversaries have gone to school on us. They saw how we did it. That's how we did it in the 90s, and they said, okay, so I see how you do it. You go there, you bring air power over first. Yeah, you gotta do that. And then they, while we're waiting to build the combat power, you sort of, you strike with the air power, you do what you can, you start building combat power, and you start trying to deter, because they see the Iron Mountain coming. And they know that our defeat mechanism is better than anybody's in the world. So we start bringing in the forces until we're ready, and then what do we do? We roll back the IADs, we make sure it's a nice clean sweep, and we go, that, that's sort of, the, the way that we've, we've captured it in very simplistic terms. And the theory of the case being that we have 
the most dominant defeat mechanism out there. Now, there are, there's evidence that some of those competitive areas are eroding, and we need to get after that. But that defeat mechanism is pretty darn powerful. And so if, 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 if you're a challenger to this, you figure, how do I make that defeat mechanism, how do I make that less relevant? Right? How, how do I adapt the way I'm thinking? Because I can't beat that. And if I do go up against it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose. So that's what they've been doing. This, you know, you see the, the terms of art, you know, the hybrid conflict or gray zone, or what they're really doing is they're giving us dilemmas on, on the way to that defeat mechanism. Uh, and so we have to figure out how to be able to fight through that, how to be able to invalidate their ability to pose dilemmas to challenge our ability to project power into a contested environment, our ability to have freedom of movement in all domains, and, and what that means in the 21st century where it may not be all the time, but maybe for fit for time, space, and purpose and effect. So we have to think about operational concepts that will enable us to do that. And then think about their strategy and how do we invalidate their strategy to, to let them know that the dilemmas that they're trying to uh, create for us, those dilemmas we have answers to. And we have answers early, and those answers have to be uh, consistent with all domain warfare, and they have to be informed by our capabilities and our posture, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I got down the wonker. I told you I was going to do that. But, but to me, that, that's that path and, and concepts, understanding the, the, the best bang for the buck concepts going into the future. You can inform that with some of the um, resource tensions and some of the higher risk elements of the plans looking on a global context. You can inform that better that way than you really could if you were just looking at individual O plans. That's one of the other benefits of global integration. Now, I realize I just jumped a time horizon, too, because the, when we're talking about the plans, the plans are normally notionally within the next couple of years of being able to execute, when concepts really need to look further forward. So there is a time horizon mechanism we need to be able to, to make sure we don't get trapped in one and, and, and build concepts you know, for today that are going to be obsolete in a few years. But I just want to park a little bit on that, uh, on that concepts piece, because that's what we're really driving to. We're understanding that as we know we need to transition, we know we need to adapt to the changing character of war and the speed that underpins it, we have to have a way that enables us to attack the adversary strategy rather than just their forces, to be able to understand and make risk-informed, tough decisions uh, in the department or project those decisions up to the president to decide. That's what this, this is really about, this global integration. And so if you get it right, you find yourself on a path that are all merging together. You're updating your concepts, you're, built, you're baking them into the services, the services are, are getting their readiness on those concepts. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about, because I really want to open up, up to questions and because um, otherwise I get really wonky. The last thing is, is how are you postured? That's the other piece I, I sort of I missed in, in this, uh, talking about the elements of global integration. How, how are you postured? How, do you, how are you going to set the force? How are you going to set the globe, if you will? You, have to, you can't do that if you're just focusing on one element of the strategy or one particular challenge. You'll find yourself out of balance. That's probably one of the toughest things that we do. And we haven't, we're still working through that right now. Um, because you're, you're left with a couple choices. You can, you, you really optimize for the risk, right? And that risk has many elements, probability and consequences, you know, being the, some of the two main factors of that. But do you posture yourself in the Indo-Pacific solely and then you figure out how to sprint somewhere else? How do you posture munitions? How do you do, th there's a lot of these elements that we didn't even know how to ask the questions before. We just knew it was gonna be tough. You're putting your plan together, and you're like, wow, this is going to suck for all the other plans because I need a lot of stuff. You know, but now we have to understand that we can't look at it in isolation. And, and posture decisions are um, they're not permanent, but they certainly they require a larger undertaking if there's infrastructure that supports them as well. So these are things that, that we really can't take lightly and make a posture decision this year that maybe we're going to turn on next year and then come back the year after. And so... As we figure out how to um, orient our posture today, and then we see the inherent challenges of it, how do we orient our concepts to where those posture decisions will be more compatible with the future that we see? Um, 
these are all sort of lofty goals of, of global integration. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to end up. I do know this. Um, I know that change is incredibly hard, and the bigger the institution, the harder it is. And I don't, I, I don't have anything against bureaucracies, but I don't think uh, bureaucracies actually uh, act with malice. But I know they have a hell of a survival instinct, and that you know that that in and of itself you have to try and overcome. So you have to start with uh, making a compelling case. And I would I would credit the chairman. You know, we were all sort of following his lead. I would credit the chairman for for doing incredible work in in doing that. I think the cases. He, he said this as well. He said, hey, th this is how we see it. If anybody sees it differently, then, then let me know. Because if you can make the case for this is the problem and we have to get after the problem, then you're halfway there. Then you're really arguing about the methods and methodologies and stuff. But I, I think it's, it makes a pretty compelling case that you can't deny uh, that where we're in is not where we need to be. And, and I think we've, we've done a decent job about laying out some of the key elements that will get us in the right direction. It may not put us exactly in the right spot, but it'll get us in motion. And once you get us in motion, it's easier to adjust when you're in motion. But it has, at least it has us pointed in the right vector. But to sort of close out and really uh, take any questions as you have, because that was maybe a little dense, um, the value of global integration is not going to be seen. We're not going to really reap the benefits until we start seeing some of the concepts that will enable you to fight differently in a way that understands um, the transregional nature and, and the fact that these threats are in all domains and it's cognizant of the fact that we can't afford the way we used to do it. And when we see that in the way that we posture and you see that the way the services are developing concepts and you see that in the maybe the better sophistication of the decision set that's there for the secretary and the president, then, then we'll know we've got there. We have a long way to go. Uh, I would say this this journey has been three and a half years, I would say probably overall. I think we really, really started to grind at it for about the last two and a half years. And there's there, there's a lot left to do. But I, I would solicit any critiques, questions, because it's all hands on deck at this point. I guess I became a Navy guy. But uh, but we, we really, this is something that we're going to have to collectively get after. And, and the different perspectives that come from uh, the different uh, um, services and and uh, backgrounds is going to be it's definitely going to be needed because the future is not going to come at us any slower than it has in the past and so the time to diagnose the problems over the time to sort of solve it is after so with that I'll, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and uh, sorry if I was too wonky but I'll happy to take any questions that you have yeah. Yeah. thank you that was that was excellent in terms of understanding thank you that was excellent in terms of understanding the, the planning function I think is cogent a a description as I've ever heard. Um, you know, with the global nature of the challenges, and you know, it could be Syria today, it could be Venezuela tomorrow, it could be the resonance of Syria and, and Venezuela. Um, how do you, as the joint force leaders, have sufficient visibility into everything that's happening, both within our forces, our perception of the adversaries, and the resonance kind of in the in the world? How, so how do you how do you get get a situational awareness at the kind of chairman level? Okay. That's I will start with um, you mentioned Syria and Venezuela. So you, you just asked the graduate level of that question. I'll start at the basic level and get your graduate level. So to be able to have a, a uh, at, at the jo at the joint staff right to be able to have that global perspective of even the the main threats that crosses uh, each of the uh, the combatant commands. We've generated a couple of new um, entities. I wouldn't say we're reorganized, but we're, we're matrixing better. So out at the combatant commands, this is a, it, there's, there's the term called a coordinating authority. And I love that term, by the way. Because if, you, if, if someone who didn't know anything about the context, of, you just look at that authority, you know, what, you have the authority to coordinate? What, what is that? You know, sort of the authority to call meetings. Um, but it can't compel decisions. But, but the idea is you, you, you would sort of put that label on the entity who you think probably has the preponderance of SA about that particular challenge. And then those others, other combatant commands sort of feed into that to help provide that global picture. So you do have a combatant command as sort of a lead, if you will, for planning and assessment. For your day-to-day, -day, there's, there's steady feeds from the J2, Joint Staff J2, coming from each of those, oriented on each of those challenges. Um, and then within the joint staff, 
We have uh, cross-functional teams, which are matrix, so they're still within their uh, you know, Napoleonic organizations, but they're, they're matrixed for particularly designed to understand all the elements uh, across the, the joint functions, um, joint staff functions of those challenges. So those are what the five challenges were. You mentioned something that's a little more sophisticated. So now you got Syria's not in that one. Venezuela's not in that one. Um, Russia is in both. Uh, you got China for sure in one, and I'm sure it's, I'm sure they got some pause in the other, but it's probably not as profitable as, as uh, Venezuela is for them. So um, that is the responsibility, again, of the combatant command. So, so let's, let's go to Venezuela. So in Southcom, Southcom is able to, you know, through its J2 and its visibility, is able to see what's going on in Venezuela, but they also can see the other players in it. So they, they sort of feed what they understand about that information to the Joint Staff as well as, in the case of Russia, to UCOM. This is what we think they're doing here and there and everywhere. So, so there is that feed from the combatant command who owns, owns, who has the responsibility for the, that geographic space to feed back to the coordinating authority, but also to feed back to our cross-functional team. So there's a, there's, there's a, a, a sort of two approaches to be able to get at that. Um, but it's a fight. It, I mean, because it, it's about battle rhythms. I hate to say it. When, it was, when it's down, how do you get your situational awareness? You get your situational awareness through the, uh, the, the meetings in which you get together and the different perspectives come together and they provide you with a, a bigger picture. So each combatant command has a battle rhythm. Are you going to try, trying to elevate that to design a, a battle rhythm for each challenge, to design a battle? It's, it's a challenge to get that information into the existing processes. But it comes with repetition. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you one example. Um, this, is, this is not a global uh, integration example, but it's an example of how the processes eventually change behavior. Um, so when I was at U.S. European Command, I would, so I got there at, in 2015, and we're, they were still sort of writing themselves on what the hell we think about what Russia was doing in Crimea the year before. But we're sort of coming to that awareness of what it means. Um, and, and before that, you know, the U.S. European Command was, was, was sort of an engagement command still. It was really building the partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So they didn't really have a, a, uh, a robust theater campaign plan, okay, back before the global, a theater campaign plan. And uh, so we wrote a theater campaign plan while I was there. We distributed it. For about six months, nobody paid attention to it. It, it wasn't until we started structuring the way the commander got the information by that. And even the commander was like, didn't, didn't get it for a little bit, but oh yeah. So once we started doing that, people knew you had to feed it into that bin in order to get that. So the same, the same sort of way in the way that we brief on our joint staff updates and things, we, if you brief by some of the, those major challenges, then people start to funnel it in. You get a, you get a, a broader perspective of that. So very long answer to short questions. <laughs> Trying to get in you. Why don't Colin Clark break in fence? Thank you, sir. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk the last few years about hybrid warfare, gray zones, mm -hmm. all this. The chairman's mentioned that we've got to be much better at reaching across the COCOMs. Mm -hmm. But we've got a wonderful system that takes us from phase zero mm -hmm. to phase one to phase two. Um, it's mechanistic. Is it useful? Should we get rid of it? I mean, aren't we really at phase like one and a half already? That's a that's a terrific one. We've, and that's a debate that that's gone on. I would say that um, from a planning perspective, I I don't know that that uh, phasing is obsolete with respect to the planning process because it's it, it it is one of the necessary building blocks to understand the the change in in, in the nature across the spectrum. So it, it's useful to understand within one phase, what your primary objective is, whether it be deterrence versus coercion versus compellence. So for a planning construct, I think it's still useful. What we need to do is we need to rid ourselves of the nasty habit of, uh, of making that planning element the way we, we think about strategy and the way we think about execution. Because as you said, that's, that's fluid. No, no enemy says, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready to go to phase two. You guys ready? So it really, we have, to, we have to be more nuanced about the conditions that exist that would drive risk, that would drive our action. Now, so what it really means is it means taking apart that construct, but, but peering into those particular activities and saying, I think we find ourselves in the strategic environment in which these type of activities are the ones the planners envisioned. 
you know, understanding the threat, understanding the objectives, et cetera, et cetera. So to be able to take what the planners had built and, and to put it into a more nuanced continuum to where the activities you're contemplating are consistent with the environment you find yourself in rather than, hey, we haven't said we're officially out of phase zero yet. So we need to be less mechanistic in our application of those. But I think to say that the phasing uh, uh, is obsolete altogether may be premature, but we are overusing them in our uh, execution decisions and risk decisions. Hi, I'm Pat Host from Jane's. Uh, is there a planning angle to the Air Force's next generation air dominance effort? And perhaps in your experience as a three-star general, uh, what capabilities or technologies are going to be critical to dominating the skies in 15, 20 years? See, see now I get to go back to my opening of, I left, I, I know there's a couple guys who have worked on that uh, since I left Air Force proper. So. I apologize, but I will. I would not be the expert on that with respect to next generation air dominance. I know the Air Force is working that hard, I, but but I think in general, uh, this is not going to be a very satisfying answer. But I would say one needs to consider the manner in which uh, air power delivers what it has delivered in the past. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to look at some people that are going to throw some stuff at me, but the the idea of what air superiority means. Um, I, don't, I think that's sort of timeless. The manner in which it's executed, is it something that is gonna be ubiquitous all time? Perhaps not. Perhaps we have to understand how to do it temporally, locally, fit for time, space, and purpose, because the previous way, given the current capabilities, unless we develop some new concepts that lets us you know, clear the skies and space and everything all together, we need to be more nuanced about the way in which we apply air power to achieve the effects we always have had, given, the, given what the enemy's done, but I, I'm not, really an expert on the next generation air dominance piece. What do you mean about uh, the manner? Well, I mean, uh, when we look at the way we did it back in the good old days, when we could roll in, we could put all the air power together, we could roll, the idea of rolling back the IADs was sort of a, let's roll back the IADs. Um, again, our adversaries have gone to school on that. So the idea that one can just roll back the IADs in a highly contested environment where there are dense, mobile, multi-domain uh, obstacles to that, that's a cost-imposing strategy. So the idea of when do we, do, do we need to have that all the time, you, you, you know, and, and the costs associated with that and the risk associated with it, when do we need to have that to, en to enable the, the joint force to maneuver in the way it needs to in order to achieve the objective? So I think it's, it's, it's more maybe temporally uh, focused rather than just ubiquitous all the time. Hi, Marty Faggett. Uh, as you develop these global plans, do you sometimes find, you know, we don't have the right force because we need more sea lift or more airlift or mm -hmm. more fighters or more army troops or something, which, um, if followed through, probably means less of something else to mm -hmm. meet the budget. So how does that all play out in this uh, process? Right, so that's, the, the value of wh where we've come so far is, um, by developing these globally integrated base plans, like I said, we're not we're not creating some um, some innovative new uh, way to to conduct warfare with these plans. What we really are doing is we are uh, really aggregating the plans as they exist and understanding the environment outside of that particular conflict to to really put a finer point on where the resource tensions are. So, as you said, you're going to find out I don't have enough of this or I don't have enough of that. But now we sort of know what the impact is of that, a little bit better than we did before. And given that, are there ways that we can mitigate that risk without having to ask for more of X or more of Y? But like I said, it, it's one of those planning building blocks that you just say, I either need more of this or I need different policy objectives, in which case I don't have to do this particular element of the plan. And so that, that, that puts me back into a force sufficiency back in the black, or I need to, uh, I need to buy more stuff or I need to you know, convince the enemy to fight differently. It, but, but the buy more stuff thing, that's just one answer. If we don't have that, we need to look at outside of the, each of the individual service capabilities. Now, if we're gonna try and advance multi-service or joint concepts, we know where we wanna focus. Well, we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of that. In, in the case of military sealift, 
on the surface, you could say, well, that's, there's not new concepts for, for sea lift. Well, perhaps not, but there are concepts that we can consider for where one might place equipment. So the cost benefit of prepositioning versus having to take it over, uh, the cost of being agile, and I, don't, I, would, I wanna go off on a side with agility. Anytime you talk about agility with a limited resource, we need to understand that that means increased demand on transport. So, so if we don't, we can't just magically be agile. It has to be something that moves us from here to there. But with respect to some of those shortfalls, we don't have enough, uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, ABCTs or we don't have enough uh, heavy sea lift or each of those things. Those, those are drawn out by these plans and they will inform either new concepts or some of the budgetary actions that'll have to fall. That's, that's really what they do. They, they better diagnose the problem. They don't deliver the solution. Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. The, the U.S. military force levels in the Middle East and Persian Gulf are at their lowest levels in decades. So what challenges does that pose to you as a strategist and a planner in, in preparing contingencies, uh, in preparing options, uh, when you have to deal with threats like, say, a, a uh, let's just say a, a threat from Iran, for example. For example, yeah. Well, I, I will, as, as the J-5, thank God I'm not the J-3, because those guys are always uh, working harder than us. But I, I can give you the general construct of, of how, uh, through global integration, we're trying to address this, given the resources that we have. Um, there's a concept uh, called dynamic force employment. Um, and this is really being able to look at and part of this is actually goes back to the globally integrated base plans to understand um, where the readiness challenges are for those particular plants. I, I, I'm going to walk my way into the answer, I promise. If you understand where the readiness challenges are and the sort of a sensitivity analysis against which those readiness challenges affect the plan, you can help the services instead of saying, hey, you got to be ready. And the service is like, you're killing me, man. Ready for what? Help me, I, I can't be ready for everything all the time. So now we can be better informed by the things that the Joint Force needs to do in these particular plants. So now you've targeted where the services need to be ready. Now we need to be, to be able to give them the opportunity to build readiness of those particular forces. And what that, what that means is there's this, there's this almost binary tension that's perceived. I don't think it's as binary as people, uh, some people make it out to be that. What, you can either be forward presence deterring or you can be back getting ready to kick butt. You can't do both. And so we're trying to make that less binary. So this dynamic force employment concept enables the services to focus on the areas that they need to build readiness and we're cognizant of the readiness levels of them and then be able to either in activities that help build readiness or activities with other forces, be able to more rapidly move forces from one theater to another. The impact of that, obviously you can't be everywhere all the time. But if you're, if you're trying to posture consistent with the strategy, you look at the attendant risk. And so if there is attendant risk with, and there's always a tension, there's always a tension against those forces you might want to put in one area that you think are going to be advantageous to deterrence. And then when you move them out of another area, does that invite an opportunistic aggressor? Th those are decisions that go back and forth. So as we look at uh, having those forces that are more dynamically employable, that's how we're trying to address the, uh, the challenge of posturing for some of the five challenges and not being optimally postured for the other. So it really, it's, it's really a matter of mobility and being more agile with the movement of forces rather than just having them parked at the expense of the others. Hi, sir. Uh, Courtney Alvin with Inside Defense. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the, the need to infuse the NDS into uh, planning mm -hmm. processes. Um, and I'm curious, in the FY20 budget, how well infused um, is NDS into that process? How do you see that progressing over the next few years? And then um, also, can you point to any specific, specific examples of where um, specific, specific processes might need to change in order to implement the strategy more quickly? And then um, the reverse, uh, where the strategy might need to be more flexible in order to adjust to the realities of the process. Sorry, a lot of questions there. No, no, no. On, on the first, uh, 
there's a really smart gentleman named Tony Irardi who's the J8, and he, he really works, but I'm not gonna dodge the question on that, he, he really works a lot of the budget implementation. But I will tell you that since the National Defense Strategy came out, there's been laser focus from the gentleman who was the Deputy Secretary, who's now the Acting Secretary, who's been the, uh, the nominee for Secretary, to focus on National Defense Strategy implementation and how we can relate that to budget activities. And so there are, there are elements with respect to the, um, so the pacing threats that perhaps we haven't, uh, we haven't resourced as well. Uh, but a lot of that is understanding this, this great power competition that's, that's really fundamental to the NDS and understanding that we need to address the, the areas of competitive advantage that have eroded and how we ensure that our, uh, our uh, budgets reflect that and our investments are designed to be able to, to either advance or to at least maintain the competitive advantage that we have in those key areas to which we think that our adversaries are starting to gain on us. So that's a general way of saying how they're trying to link specifically um, the, uh, the budget proposals. Understanding that this, this is another challenge of agility. I promise I'll come back to the other two to the extent that I can. But agility and bureaucracy just don't, man, same sentence, they don't, and it's, tough, it's tough to make a sentence that an English teacher would, would, would accept. But the idea of, of, of building um, a different force, building a force that is adapted to the strategic environment, there's a big tail on that, and there's industry. And so under, having, being able to com communicate to industry that this is the type of force we need, and it may not be consistent with a lot of the, the planning that, that, that was maybe considered for these current systems to last, well into the future. And so there's a, there's a challenge of the sunk costs in the current systems that were built with it, maybe with a different concept in mind, and the sort of the, the Moore's Law requirement for more adaptable. And that, that's, that's something that uh, the folks in the, in the programming and budgeting world, they, it's, it's just tough work for them. And, I've, and I'm, I see Dr. Moore in the background, who's, who, who where back when I was on the air staff, worked that very hard. But that's the, that's the challenge of the entire enterprise, I think, is how we adapt the defense industry as well to be able to to recognize and respond to. I don't, I don't think the defense industry is, is balking at it. There's just We need to have good communication to have them better understand how to adapt as well as the entire joint force adapts. The whole tail that supports the, the joint force needs to as well. Um, with respect to, you said the process is adapting to the strategy. So I, I uh, again, I, you let me dig down to my sweet spot, which is the wonkery, but there are, there are, um, there are processes that did not exist before that draw that link from the NDS and the plans that support them to actual force management, to actually deploying forces or allocating forces to the combatant commands. For example, if you have a plan, you develop a plan, you're starting to execute the plan, you've got to assess your progress on that plan. You have to have that assessment be compelling enough to where it, it, it illuminates areas where you're falling short and then you cross that over with what are the more bigger priorities of the department. When you overlay those two, you, here's the areas that we're falling short on, and here's the areas that the department is really focused on. Now you're starting to draw out some areas you can say, we need to apply resources, activity, whatever, against these particular problems because we're falling short. Unless you link that to a discussion about what forces you're gonna allocate in the future and how those forces might act in a way that'll get after those objectives, you, it's just, it's cut. So what we're trying to do now is develop that linkage. And once, so I sort of said it tongue in cheek before, but once the folks who are, who are in the game of getting the forces and getting the stuff, uh, once they understand that that plan assessment is important, now all of a sudden the assessments will get better, the plan will get better, and that link will be tight. So that's something that we haven't had before that we're trying to do. You, and then the last thing you said was the, uh, the strategy's ability to adapt. Now the strategy, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not going to grade the department's homework, but if I was, I'd give them a pretty decent grade for, for this particular strategy. And it is, it is broad enough. Strategies should be broad enough that there should be flexibility within them that, are, that remain true to the tenets of the strategy and, and may not every decision you make, because you can't make every decision based on the priorities of the strategy. Otherwise, you'd have a, everything would be, num number one would be just that one element and everything else would suffer. So the strategy is designed to be able to be, um, to allow that sort of flexibility. The extent to which we're succeeding on it, I think, I think history will grade us, but we're certainly giving it the best effort on how we adapt the processes and, and maybe adapt the implementation of the strategy 
as the world gets a vote and comes at us. Sure, we've got time for one more. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sir, Ron Cleves from uh, F-35 Program Office. Uh, you're, you're familiar with that phrase, um, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Um, that was generated or given credit to a Prussian military commander in 1880, so 139 years ago. Uh, someone uh, made mm -hmm. that statement. Um, you talked about planning guidance, intel assessment, policy objectives, forces, and the way in which those capabilities are used. However, uh, you know that there's issues with intel assessments. We didn't get it right with the fall of Soviet Union, 9-11, ISIS, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, Iranian embassy. But we also have this issue with will, our nation's will. And I'm wondering what is your... Um, do you put um, the nation's will in your calculus? Because we just had Russia attack Crimea, take Crimea. Um, we're fighting by proxy in most of the wars right now. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's a will. We, you could argue that a lack of will created ISIS. So what's the calculus that you guys have in, in regard to nation's will of, of doing um, basically what your old plan state? So I will, uh, that's it. It's a question that I am not going to answer directly. I'm going to try and I'm, I am going to answer directly, but it's probably not going to be satisfying. But I would say the other quote that, you know, there's no plan survives first contact. There's also the value is not in the plan, it's the planning. Because planning also changes the way that you're thinking, the way you're approaching. And so when you're actually doing the activity, even though the plan itself is, is well, we can't use that anymore, there are, there are ways of thinking and perspectives that drive uh, the execution that will still have that plan have value, even though you won't come out of it looking like you went into it. With respect to the will, that's, um, frankly, once, now, now this, this is my personal opinion, I'll tell you professionally, that's not in, that is not in necessarily the operational planning, because what we are tasked to do in the department and what the joint staff just to, to uh, support the chairman and his vice to the president and the secretary, these plans are designed to attack uh, to, to address the military dimension of a particular national security objective. And so it's designed to understand the critical capabilities, the critical vulnerabilities, the center of gravity, all those things that say, if we are going to address this challenge through the military dimension, this is the manner in which we would do it, given the objectives we were given by policy. There is, there is no part of that particular calculation in which you say, but if the political will isn't behind you, you do X, Y, or Z. It's, it's just not, it, it's not sort of germane. And, and I think if one were to consider that, it would be a fascinating academic exercise, but I think you might find the second and third order facts, in fact, we may not be too pleased with the military putting the thumb on the, the will of the people, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, best we stay in our, in our box on that would be my answer. Thank you. 